All right, everyone. If we could come back to our tables. Um, I know folks are making the last grab of coffee. <laughs> But I'd like us to resume the conversation. I was just saying to Jaretta how impressed I've been with the attentiveness of this group of conference participants. And I hope we can continue to hold your attention. The prior presentations have been stellar. I know that this evening we'll have a spectacular event we have another great workshop commencing after Jaretta's presentation. We'll have a great event at St. John's tonight. Tomorrow, we will have an outstanding panel. We'll hear from the editor of Forbes, uh, Rich Carlgaard. If you've not heard him speak, it's an appointment type speech. And we'll close with Freeman Rabowski tomorrow. So as attentive as you've been today, I hope we can sustain that because the conference is designed to really continue at this high level and we're looking forward to your engagement. But right now we have an incredible and dynamic um, planning opportunity that will be led by Jaretta Nelson. And I have to say it gives me a special joy to introduce Jaretta. Jaretta is the senior vice president and owner of Credo an organization dedicated to the support and sustainability of private higher education and the success of the students we serve. Jaretta and Credo's contributions to higher ed are numerous and generous. They've been long-term supporters of CIC President's Institute and AGB, and I hope you'll join me right now in thanking Jaretta and Credo for their support of Liberal Arts Illuminated this year. But what I know and want to share about Jaretta is actually about her personally. Jaretta has a fierce commitment to our sector and to the liberal arts. Jaretta's the colleague who pushes you and challenges you to act and to do your best work. I think she embodies the King quote Lynn shared last night about feeling the fierce urgency of now. But I recently learned through a little internet pursuit that one of Jaretta's favorite quotes is, working hard for something we don't care about is called stress. Working hard for something we love is passion. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Jaretta and inviting her to share her passion with us. Thank you. Well, I, I just hope that someday each one of you has the, uh, the sheer pleasure of being introduced like that by a friend and a colleague. Um, it makes me both feel old as well as really honored to do this work. So uh, it's my task to bring us back to where we were prior to Brandon's illuminating uh, hour. And uh, I've always really relished as a, as a element or a high school teacher and then as a faculty member in my time having the afternoon class right that was always the best thing so that 130 slot is really the ideal slot especially you follow somebody like Brandon who's so terrific but I, I just want to get us right back on point I'll share more about our work and what we've learned as we go through that but as I said to to Mary um, if I'm if I'm right about this this is about you walking away tomorrow afternoon with something to do Right? You have plenty to do when you get back, I get it. But uh, with you having something to do. So I want to pull us back to the workshop that we started midway through the morning, and I have put the outcomes back up. I am nothing if not, tell them what you're going to teach them, teach them, and tell them what you taught them. Remember that, for those of us who ever, who ever talked about that? And I just want to remind you, what we were trying to do in this second workshop was really help, uh, help the group, the team, the school, whether you're one person or a team, to think about our gaps and then to say, what is it that's possible within those gaps? But the third point is the point that drives me the craziest, and that is, what are you going to do? I just, uh, I'll share my passion as we go these next little time together about at Credo, we've worked with over 350 independent colleges and universities over the last whatever time. And I've been with Credo about 11 years, and I've done now work with 150 or so schools. 
And if I have to go to one more place where I've been before and they haven't done anything since the last time I visited, I'm going to give up on our industry. We are notorious for talking about it and not doing it. So then I hear from folks when I come to conferences like this, well, it's just way too big. That's what I hear. Second thing I hear is, well, I don't have the power in this room to do anything. You know, all those people, they, the they. That's the other thing I learned, right? I started out as a faculty member, and then I went to the dark side of being a division leader. Oof, that was bad, right? And then I went to the really dark side and became a vice president for enrollment management. If you don't think that's dark, that was dark. I felt called to all that move. And then the worst of all is I became a consultant. And you know, that's really on the shadow side of the world. And as I went through that whole process, I learned that one of our greatest challenges is we like to call others on the they on a regular basis. I haven't met anybody, whether it's a president, a board, or faculty, or staff, who don't have a they in higher ed. Some of you right now, the they is students. And some of you, the they is the families of those students as well. And, and I have been recently hearing that some of the they is the K through 12. You know, if I hear one more time on campuses, well, if you just send us better prepared students, I just want to say, what world are you living in, right? So one of my worries about bringing all these brains together in this room, this glorious group of thinkers, is that you've each got a they in the room and that nothing will change as of Friday, right, or Thursday. So I'm going to push you a little bit, and uh, I hope Mary lets me come back in a couple of years as well. But I, I, it's not about being a friend. Right? It's about being an advocate for change. And, and I just want to say, I, I don't believe the model can remain the same. And I mean the model of seat time and face time and costs, the things that we've talked about. I don't think it's going to stay the same. For the Ivies and for a few of you in this room, you might be able to survive a little bit longer. But the world is changing, and you are missing an opportunity if we don't change the model. So if I hear at your table that you've said, I don't have a president or a provost or leadership that's going to back me, I want to say, what are you going to do in your division right now then? Because the places that I'm seeing across the country where it's really happening, it's happening from the middle. And I don't mean that pejoratively. I mean people are equipped and empowered with their passion. And I went into teaching. I don't know about you guys who are in this room. I went into teaching because I love students. I do. Right? I love Renaissance choral music. That was my background. And I thought all students would love Renaissance choral music. That's not so true, right? I learned that quickly. But I went together with those two passions. I didn't get any training on how to teach. I knew squat about committee service. I had no, I didn't even know what advancement was. Right? I didn't know about the machinations of higher ed in any way. But I got in because I love what transforms students. And I think there are people on our campuses right now, maybe in this room, who want to do the same thing. So don't let the they's keep you from doing some action, right? I, I hope when you, when you talk to Mary in the coming weeks, you went back, you did something, you saw the beginning of results. So here's what our outcomes were. Here's what I want you to do in teams at your table. And I don't want you to fake it. I want you to really dive back in, all right? I want, what were the key learning points that you took away from the panel? I'm going to just sit for, if Brandon's work comes inside to that, that's great. But I want to pull us back to where we began with Jillian and where, we, we, where Tia took us in the thinking. I love that intentionality about inclusion and the courage to do that as well. And then what Noah shared just all blew my mind to think again about the diversity of diversity, right? And, and our responsibility to that end. So I'm going to give you two minutes. I'm timing it. You either go into your notes and circle them, or you write them down. Key learning points, individually. Uh, no talking. How's that for an assignment? Ready, go. All right. Now we're going to go around the room, around the table, and I want you to share the one that's most important to you that comes to mind. If you could only find one, share that one. Just quickly, you don't get to have a whole paragraph. You get to just share what was the th learning that you had around the table. That'll take us about four minutes. Ready, go. One last instruction. Can I give you one last? One last instruction. So 
I'd like to encourage you to come up with three. I put on the, on the uh, PowerPoint says five, but just three. And if you're more than one institution at the table, then I do at this point want you to sort of segment out into that. And I'm thinking about what will you say as the top three points of learning that would be a script or a narrative around the workshop content this morning. So when you go back and the president says, and that second workshop, I'm sure that's exactly what your president will say, right? That second workshop, what happened? But what would be the script that you would say would be the top three learning elements that you'd like to hold on to about workshop number two panel this morning? Could you come to consensus on what those three are? And would someone at your table who represents your team document that for us on that addendum that we have or that, work, that workbook that we have? Take about two minutes, consensus on three, go. Okay, I'm gonna ask for volunteers. Is there a table? Is there an institution that would be willing to share their top three? Anybody in the room? Ready to share? Awesome, table seven, Margaret, you got it? All right. Whoever's ready. Read my writing. It's interesting, isn't it? I, I can hear a little bit from my colleagues right here at the front. I'd love to eavesdrop on, on conversations. I just love to have a, a content that drives deeper discussion than just the problem. So I love this combination, Mary, the way you guys have planned the event where we get some solutions, but we also know how to apply those to the problem. And I also think it's, imp it's really important to be on the same page about what we believe is most critical. Right, that, that same page piece, we find going across campuses that one of the obstacles to any kind of action is that we, we are not on the same page about what's most important. And we're notorious for listing everything that's important. And we get stuck by how long the list is. Instead of being able to say, these will be the three that we will attack this year. I think that's part of sequencing and prioritizing that would be real important. So would a table share for us, what would you say were the top three? Table seven, where are Ta you from? Table seven came up with these three. Know your data, pretty obvious from this morning. Everyone can be a mentor. Mm. And that's a both and, meaning the career and liberal arts integration. Yes, yeah, really important learning. Somebody else, another table? Margaret, you got table 12 for us? All right, table 12 came up with, um, <laughs> so, it, sorry, it, it's not my handwriting. <laughs> no, everyone is an educator. We are all first responders. Uh, that was a key one. The other one is uh, we can't work on inclusion until we know who is excluded, which would include obviously, um, especially in this day and age, learning to live in a world where you don't exist, being able to uh, confront that mm. issue head on. Mm. Um, and the third was, well, action, not just talking. Um, and all students must have a high quality learning experience, mm, so. Great, great. I, um, one of the things I have found so interesting, I don't know if Tia is still here in the room. Where, there she is. Um, so now that I've, I've had this phenomenal experience with co uh, many colleagues at Credo, just going across the country and talking to so many folks, and we also do a thing at Credo called a strategy day where we invite presidents for no fee to just come in and talk to us for a day. It's how we learn a lot, right, about what's going on. And I'm so amazed by the number of presidents, the board and the cabinets I work with, and I'll just say, so, you know, just break down the data for me a little bit, you know. Tell me, who's thriving? I usually ask that. Who's thriving? And then I would say, and how do you know? Right? And what do you know about them thriving? And then who's not? And how do you know that? And here's what I usually hear. This is at highly selective and open enrollment. I hear, well, you know, people who get involved, really. Now there's something new, yeah. <laughs> people who get involved. And uh, our students who come academically prepared. Well, that narrows it down for us. It's amazing how many of us don't have the data and how powerful the data can be in transforming our priorities. It keeps, I think data keeps our priorities straight. We do a lot of strategic planning at Credo. How do you decide what to do in the next three to five years? You pay most attention to where you can have the greatest impact. And you only know that through data. I hope that's gonna be a running theme that would go, would go after. That takes me right to the slide. We have a, a phrase in Latin at, at Credo, I won't try to pronounce that in front of you, but I will say that it translates to action follows belief. 
And I, I've already made my point with you that I really am concerned as we go across the country to do our work that what's missing are the teeth underneath it. So we've done a little bit of work. I want to share that with you, talk about a couple of models, and then I'm going to get you right into your work. I could already hear it like tables two and three. I think you've identified a gap you want to go at, right, that you might want to work on as a team. And I'm hopeful that that's part of what came out in this early conversation. Just stick with me for a minute. I'll get you right back into your teams to do that work. So at Credo, we have done a, a, a lot of looking at independent colleges and universities over the last multiple years, about 15 or so years. We've been in together around for about 25, but we've gotten really targeted about this, and we have found that institutions that are outperforming in multiple ways have these common dimensions, and they're not going to be surprising to you at all. There's nothing about them that you would say, oh my, that's, you know, that's groundbreaking. And I just want to say the same thing I'm sure George Koo says, if Jillian's still in the room. So you've known about high impact practice for, for this many years. How come you're not doing it? Right? I, 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 in fact, I gave him a really hard time. The last time I heard him speak, I think he used the same PowerPoint he used 25 years ago. And I was teasing him about that, and he said, well, it's not the, it's not the content. We've got more data to go. I just can't get people to do it. Right? That's the challenge. So there's nothing life-changing in these dimensions, but what we've learned is that campuses are really acting on them. So at, you know, we see that campuses focus on student learning and success across the country. This is becoming a focus, and we're getting this from boards as well, who will invite us in and say, we know we've got to think about learning and about student success. We know we have to think about our environment, our virtual environment. We get a lot of calls about, should we be investing in building or not building? What's that look like now? How does that work? 20 years ago, we saw a lot of student centers still going up. You know what we see a lot today as we study architecture and campus master planning? A lot of living rooms going up these third spaces that were introduced to our culture in these past uh, number of years have found their way into the higher education community where we're trying to find that kind of space where faculty and staff can speak together, right, in community outside of, of the classroom as well. So they're concentrating on their environments. They're concentrating on net revenue and strategic finance. And I'm gonna stand with Brandon here. If you find it to be an affront, that we would have to talk about revenue and finance, then you might be a part of the resistance. Because we can, no margin, no mission. We cannot fund the work that you know how to do if we don't have the funds. And I'm telling you right now, again, Mary, you may not have me back. We are too expensive for the work that needs to take place. Not for the value proposition, but for the work that is let yet for us to do. Uh, we, we have not been most efficient. I heard someone say recently, we didn't get into the business of higher ed for efficiencies. And I thought, well, that's really true. I, I, no one told me how expensive it was to teach private piano until my dean told me how, how expensive it is to run a performing arts department. And you realize what that, what that cost is and the value that we bring to the table and yet what the cost is. So net revenue, strategic finance, all colleges and universities are thinking about that. And they're thinking about what we call institutional self-esteem. And that's culture, right? Being proud of the students that you serve, serving them well, being proud of the work that you do, being so well informed about how that works that you rise above the challenges that you're facing today. And then finally, getting really good at telling your story. Brandon talked a lot about that. And I feel like we have allowed the world to tell the story of what we do because we have not done that well. And that doesn't just mean pouring our money into marketing. It means having the proof and having the stories. If I go to one more campus that says, yep, we've got great outcomes and great stories, and I say, where are they? And they say, well, we really have trouble collecting those. <laughs> It will listen to people laugh every place I go. Yeah, that happened. I think, why haven't, why haven't we addressed that? Why don't, why don't you hand your president and your board and your admission team 10 new stories a week to tell of how it works? You know, it, you, you give our admission counselors a really hard time. By the way, they're 25 years old. They typically just graduated from your institution. And they've got the most important job on the campus with the least amount of training. That's right. <laughs> And then they walk past your office and they say something wrong. And we throw our hands up and say, well, we better just get some new admission counselors. And I just kind of want to scream and say, equip your people. Give them the stories they need. Equip each other. And who has those stories? Usually our faculty have those stories. And how do we get the stories of our students? 
I have a slide I didn't show you, but it's hidden. So if Mary gives you the, the uh, deck, the PowerPoint deck, there's a slide in there that'll make you really mad. But one of my questions is, why are we waiting for others to prove it? Where are our champions? I, I can't, why are we here, <laughs> right? Where are the champions out there? Where are the storytellers that should be out there? So that, that's what every institution's worried about. Here's the difference maker. It's courageous leadership. So if you thought it was gonna be something magic, I'm sorry. I leaned over to my team, Tia, this morning, and, and uh, Matt and to Leah, and I said, see those three people up there? Jillian's sitting there, Tia's sitting there. I should say those four people. Mary's sitting there, Noah's sitting there. I said, those are courageous leaders. Even Tia's response to you of just saying, it's hard, right? It, stand up, it's hard. It takes courageous leadership right now. And it takes courageous leadership at every level. If I could spend some time talking to you, I'd talk about the power of what we are seeing in the middle across the country. We're being invited in more and more to come in and do what we call, I hope this is not affrontive to you, but uh, uh, aspiring leaders workshops, where people who are deans or associate directors who want, a, who want a life in higher ed, and they're saying, I got no pathway. Because that registrar is going to be here forever. That's clear. Every registrar seems to stay forever. I hope there's no registrars in the room. But I'm never going to get that job if I don't. So what am I going to do? How am I going to be raised up and lifted up? Succession planning is where it's at. I'll just tell you. If we want to be a part of the future in changing models, we've got to raise up the next generation of thinkers. If, you, if the VPs in this room and the presidents in this room don't have a number two that you could turn to right now, we're going to be in trouble, right? So it's that courageous leadership. It's a clear and compelling vision. I can't tell you how many campuses we go to do work at where, they th where faculty and staff throw up their hands and say, we don't know where we're headed. And you think to myself, my goodness, I can't believe that. Right? We don't have a clear and compelling vision. Or our vision is a restatement of our mission statement. It doesn't tell us what does the world look like in five years if we do this work really well. right? What is driving us forward? Clear, compelling vision and a culture of innovation and planning. I'm going to change that word, innovation. Where's Brandon? I just saw, saw you come in. There. Yeah. That word does not resonate anymore. I, I just wish you would experiment. So I give you this word, pilot. <laughs> right? I just say, it's a gift to you. Try piloting something, would you? Because we can't seem to get anyone on campuses to test and try and fail, and test and try and fail, right? And if we don't do it, how can we expect our students to do it? Why don't we get some funding along those lines? If you're going to do reallocation of funds, put it into a test and try. And try it, OK? So I, I, we are struggling so much with that. And part of that is the resistance in this room. I'm just going to say it. Because the other thing you hear when you're a consultant, an old consultant, we tried that before. That'll never work. Those are the two. We tried that before. That'll never work. The other one is they will never let us do that. Right? And I hear that, and I think, where's my courageous leadership? Where are you standing, folks? It, you, you have to move past these, this resistance. And sometimes I think it's passive aggressive resistance. I think you say it because I'm going to speak to myself. I think we say it to each other because we don't want to change. I, I beg to differ that the gen ed or core curriculum on some of your campuses is really creating an integrative, transformative experience. I'll bet you there'll be some ch challenges if you measure that. Many of the campuses we're working at do not put their very best faculty teaching their very first year students because our very best faculty want to teach Renaissance choral music. I don't want to teach music <laughs> appreciation. And that was the first assignment I got, right? We want to teach up here. We don't want to teach down here, right? And so I'd say we need to take our own medicine. And sometimes our passive aggressiveness is, I don't want to really make that change. I don't really want to look that closely. So I'm going to go right at us on innovation and planning. If it doesn't come back from this room, I don't know where it's going to come from if it doesn't come back from this room. And then the last one is a habit of reflection and intentionality. Uh, you are not going to make more money, and you cannot raise tuition over and over and over again. I don't care if it's public or private. That's not, you can't do it on the backs of students. Where is it going to come from? It's got to come 
from reallocation and focus and new ways of doing things. It isn't how much they borrow per year. It's year five and six that are killing them, right? When you look at the numbers across the board, that's where the problem is. They're willing to make the investment but when they don't see the long run, when they don't see the end. And I ask you, why does it take so long? And you say to me, they are not prepared. And I say to you, whose problem is that? Well, get those admission counselors would just bring us brighter students. <laughs> and by the way, John is going to talk about this, this afternoon. If they could come from the long lost island of full pay students, <laughs> that would be ideal. And I, I, having been in the enrollment management side and, and standing behind the table, I used to go during the travel season, I would replace an admission counselor at least once every two weeks. So I had the experience of what that was like. They do not walk up to my table and say, I'm looking for personal fulfillment. <laughs> they don't. And so you put me in that position, it's a difficult position. It is, it has, it has drastically impacted us in the way that students receive. I love, someone used the Trojan horse illustration at our table this morning. And I love that, was it spoken? And then we picked it up at the table as well, right the, early this morning of how we might how we might bring someone in and say, if you want to come because you want a, 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 a position, a job, come on in. And we'll talk about that. While you're here, you're going to be personally transformed. Because that's what happens, right? Anybody in this room who's taught, as long as many of us have taught, we've seen the lights go on. We know when the lights go on. But they don't necessarily go on on the first day of class. Right? It takes a lot of work to make that happen. This stuff down here on the bottom, this is the work. Courageous leadership, collaborative leadership. So let me give you a few ideas of some of those models. People say, uh, in fact, I asked a couple people here, what do you wish out of this conference? Well, I sure hope I can come and I can get four or five new ideas. And I always cringe a little bit about that because I'm so worried that you'll go snatch something and try to apply it to your campus. And I want you to know, in the work that we're doing with independent colleges, we don't see that transfer as well. So we'll often go to a campus and we'll say, where'd you get that idea? Well, they do it up the road. And they have great success. And I say, well, they do it up the road, and it's, it's successful there, because it fits them, right? But what do you need to do? So let me give you an illustration of going right at the gap. You all know Cedar Crest College? Pennsylvania, yeah, another women's college. For those of you who are from, um, uh, are Bennies in the room, you would know. I appreciate what Carmen did there. Carmen Ambar was the president. She's now moved over to Oberlin. And one of the things she identified as the gap was that they were beginning to bring more and more women who were underserved, right, for a variety of reasons, okay, both economically and, and first generation readiness, et cetera. And so, you know, the solution to the high impact practice, of course, is we know the power of study abroad. We all know that. We've been studying that forever. But everyone said to her, Carmen, well, you can't do that because, because here, 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 and all the reasons why you can't do that, right? So let's just do study away. And Carmen said, well, that just doesn't make any sense. Because they're not getting the cultural capital of readiness of a global experience that other people are. And I want that for my students. So that's going to be our difference maker. I'm going to make that a very clear and compelling vision. I'm going to plan around that. I'm going to assess around that. And I'm going to raise some money for that. And this is the third year based on fundraising that is now in an endowment. They take the entire sophomore class at the same time out of the country. And don't you know, that is a tremendous investment in the capital of those young women. By the way, and in their families. Because many of those families had never applied for a passport in their lives. So they used the whole first year to train the family about what it means to travel and to study abroad, and to get the family ready for reflection about the experience as well. That's an example. It worked there for such a time as that. Does that make sense? Now, if you go back and say that Jaretta Nelson from Credo said you should do that, I would say you're crazy because it worked for them. That's one model, right? Another model that's been around for a long time that I still hold dear in my heart is Alverno College. No grades. I remember reading about that when I was a student and thinking, that's where I want to go. No <laughs> grades, right? And I remember what the first time I taught at the collegiate level, I taught at a community college, and I had to teach counterpoint. Musicians in the room will know 
That's not the easiest thing to teach at a, at a community college. And I had to teach counterpoint. And I thought, I have no idea how to teach this. I have no idea how to go into this environment. And I started looking at pedagogical sort of research and what were people doing differently. And I came upon Alverno. All abilities based, right? Abilities based education. No matter how you come in, underprepared, underserved, no matter what it is, you get mentoring and readiness in those seven, eight skills now they've added, all the way through all four years. They still take English, they take philosophy, they're nursing majors who come out of there, but they are managed and cared for and grown up in their skills by mentoring, and boy, you want to talk about a system that takes about 450 professionals in Milwaukee who help them assess and manage that movement. And one of the challenges is you can't scale that, can you, any longer? That's a very difficult model, but it's a model that has been empowering to underserved students. Does that make sense to you? Boy, does that take a lot of courage? People keep telling them it's way too expensive. And when Mary Meehan was the president there, she said, this is where we will stay and where we will go. And we will raise the money to be able to do that. Started out with adult women going back to school 30 years ago. It's now meeting young women and adult women with children going back to school, right? So it's a powerful model. There are a couple of others out there that I, I, I'll tell you about as we go through the next uh, half hour or so. So there are some ideas. Yes, it's happening out there. And in each case, it took clear and compelling vision, piloting, <laughs> experimenting, planning. In each of those cases, by the way, they did a bit of a pilot an experiment to see, to test, does this work? Really clear reflection and intentionality, measuring that, and very courageous leadership. So what we want to do now, as we go forward, is we want to get something done, right? Action follows belief. So this is our time. Look at that. I'm right on time. It hardly ever happens, so uh, uh, kudos here. Um, pick your gap. So I want to give you, at your teams, what do you think? Maybe five minutes? Can you get the gap solidified between you in about five? Or do you need longer than five minutes? Somebody give me a sense of that. I'm not getting any sense, so I'm going to go to eight minutes. OK. <laughs> Here's what I want you to do. You, based on our topic, our topic is, remember our topic, as we disaggregate our data and we think about our all, our, all of our students experiencing the liberal arts in the same way, what do we want to do? is the question. So you probably have multiple gaps that you've identified early on. Pick the one that you're going to address. How do you know that's your gap? I want you to answer that question. And just craft a little sentence or two about what your goal would be like. All right? Eight minutes. You've got to do that in. Someone needs to document it for you. Go. So I think it's so important to be clear about what you're trying to accomplish. It's interesting, as I just listened to conversations, we have a lofty goal. You know, the, the, the uh, conference itself, it sets such a lofty goal, doesn't it? Liberal arts illuminated. How can we use the liberal arts to create a more inclusive and welcoming and transformative? That, that's a big goal. And I think sometimes we can get stuck there. And I want to say a worthy goal is to get to know your data. So, so start small, <laughs> right? It's OK to say our first step. I, I, right now, I bet right now if I asked you, you would know some students who are at risk, who are, not, who are not experiencing what you want them to experience. You probably know that, even have the data to go with that. I wish you would take some uh, appropriate action around addressing them and then letting that build elsewhere as well. All right, so you've got, I hope you've got a clarified goal. Someone in your teams needs to have written this down for you. So here's what we think our gap is, and here's what we're going to try to address. Now, here's what I want you to do. This is a little bit different tack than, um, than the way our um, academic impressions guide is. And this, this shows the credo bias a little bit. Um, and you heard me already give a bit of bias, and that's, is, is leadership. So what I want you to talk about now at the table is what kind of power do you have? What kind of leadership do you have at the table right now? What I, what I want you to avoid is, well, we don't have all the power people here. 
Okay? What I want you to say is, what can we do? What can you do as an individual, and what can a small team do? And I just want conversation, but I want someone to write something down. And I want it to be a statement. We as a team will have the ability in our leadership to do the following related to our goal. Right? This is the way we all lose weight, the way we all exercise. We must write these things down. Yes? Anybody have children or grandchildren? Right? You want to do something? We're going to write it down. As we That's what you're going to do. But you only have five minutes for this discussion. Candor, please. Leadership discussion. Go. OK. All right, next, next question. Next question. How's this for kind of bringing you down? But let's do a reality check. My colleagues uh, sitting over in the corner, Matt Trainum and Leah Van Landingham are with me, and we, we have noticed in the last uh, couple of years in particular that discussions around resistance are really important. So what I want you to do is just take a couple, I'm, I'm just gonna give you a couple of minutes and say, here, we know what our gap is and what we wanna accomplish. We've just talked about what we can own individually and as a group. And I just want you to speak out loud. What, are, what kind of resistance are you gonna face when you go back on campus? Just say it out loud. And, and then I'd like someone to say, and here's how I think we could solve that resistance. Two minutes, go. All right. Last instruction. Last one. Last instruction. Last instruction. I came from a campus uh, a couple of weeks ago, just getting ready for its upcoming accreditation visit. Uh, and I asked that campus, um, so what's your work been like getting ready for the accreditation visit? And the leadership told me, I think we're ready. Uh, when last they came, which was 10 years ago, when last they came, uh, we had just started our work on revising our core curriculum. And now they're going to be coming back, and we have a committee together. <laughs> and I know a few people on that accrediting team. <laughs> Uh, I, we just are not fast to move. So my last instruction, you may feel like, oh, this exercise this afternoon is just too fast. I, I want you to know, folks, sometimes all it takes is clear intention and just a first step. So our last instruction to you this afternoon, uh, also to, to write down, this, this, this is on behalf of those of us at Credo to say, what will be the first step you take on Thursday? This is the assumption you're not going on vacation. Uh, after Wednesday, but that you're going back to campus. And I literally want you to say what will be the first step that you will take. And as a team, make a commitment to that. And then I would be so grateful if one table, one campus, would be willing to share all four of these. And we're going to stay in this room and lock the doors until one table <laughs> is willing to do that. So, so somebody who's, uh, who's willing to share. And my rationale behind that is it's not difficult to come to clarity on what you need to do and the steps to do it. And I just want to demonstrate that that can be done. So the last assignment now is right now, what is the first step that needs to be taken? And could you take it on Thursday? Could you make that commitment on Thursday? I'm only going to give you two minutes. And then I need, um, I need someone to volunteer, if you would. Two minutes, go. <laughs> All right. Who's going to help us out? Do I have a volunteer? There is such a thing as being voluntold. Who's going to volunteer? Just share one table. One table that would walk us through those four steps. Somebody? Oh, come on. Awesome, table number seven, thank you. Let's hear it for table seven. 
She accidentally raised her hand. I think she was just trying to swat a fly. I'm not sure. Well, the private college council person at our table who's a loner <laughs> said that we skipped some steps. What? They didn't follow your rules. Yes. A break the rules, go for it. Okay, no problem. Our goal is to have a digital, usable primer or primer. We've had a conversation about the word. <laughs> not here, but previously. Digital primer on which we've already done a fair amount of work that has visual representation of things like graduation rates, retention rates by groups of students, by majors, mm. and our terminology that St. Olaf wants to own with all these words, mm. equity and inclusion and inclusive excellence and so on. So we want that primer to be uh, available to all our staff and faculty memorized by said groups of people. Yep. And with the opportunity to have a hard copy, lovely decorated, done by our Marcom people mm -hmm. on their desks. So, and it will include the mission of the college mm. and our statement of whatever we have, our statement of inclusion. So it'll be a nifty little document, changeable because it'll be digital. Once a year we'll update it. Now, our f resistance is we argue about terms in academia. So some will say, you called this a primer. <laughs> More serious resistance is we're very afraid of student protests. Many of you have seen St. Olaf on the front page in the last few years. We've yeah. had protests. Many colleges have. Um, we're afraid of faculty protests. Oh, why are you putting out this kind of, why are you taking these risks? We're just going to take the risks. Partly because we have a Mellon grant and we can do some of the risk taking. Um, so that will be a little resistance, but our next stage is to invite in some of the people who are most worried to a meeting the last week of August, which I will set on Thursday. Oh, so let's hear it for table five. So I, I just want to thank you guys for sharing. I, and, and while a step such as a synthesis of our information in a form that we can easily understand and read may seem like a simple step. I, across the country, I want to say, how come we haven't already done that on a regular basis? So when Credo gets to come, how come I don't have that? So I can know that about you, right? So it's an important first step to take. And, and in your case, you're sharing with us, it's going to also raise some conversations. And I heard the word fear. And I, I just want to name that word. This is not the only place where there's going to be fear in the room, right? It was already named this morning. We cannot work from that place of fear, or we have to work, I guess I should say, from that place of fear and say we have the right intentions going forward as we do this work. Sometimes I think, I, I don't know about you on campuses, but I think sometimes we make more out of what might happen than what will really happen. We, I, as a faculty member, have been known to do that a bit as well. So, I thank you for the courage of sharing that as you go forward. I, my wish for all of you as a, as a person who talks with presidents all the time is I, I will often say what kind of professional development is happening on your campus, where are people getting their, their work uh, uh, empowered, et cetera. Well, I know they're doing things, but I don't really know what's happening. When you go back on Thursday, one thing you could do is you could immediately write to the person to whom you report and or your president. And you could say, I attended. Here are the top five things I learned. And here's some action that our team talked about taking place. Thank you for supporting, whether it got paid for or not by that individual, thank you for supporting this kind of conversation. That goes a long way to tilling the soil for what you're going to do, OK? Secondly, you as a team need to talk about this as you go forward. I don't know what's going to happen in August, if that's the start of the semester for you or not. But there is nothing like having a cross-section of teams stand up in front of faculty and staff, faculty and staff, and saying, here's what we learned, and here's what we care about. Here's what we want to bring back to the table. We live in isolation. CFOs go one way. CAOs go another. Faculty go a different direction. Enrollment goes a different direction. To have this kind of people in the room all at the same time, really powerful. So make sure you report back. I greatly appreciate that. Last slide, and then we take our break. And I told uh, Matt and Leah, I think this is a great one for us to, to think about. Uh, at Cradle, we've, we've done strategic planning now for such a long time. And we used to say that, that uh, we would go visit schools who would tell us that they were, they were prepared to, to do some grandiose plan. I, I remember being on one campus that said, our solution is going to be to start a law school. 
and not only was that the wrong time to think about starting a law school, if you pay any attention to the record of the last 10 years, but we said to them, you can't even get your mail out on time in terms of operations. So you need to get your operations straight before you can take on such a major move. And I remember for many years saying the same thing to campus after campus. I think those times are over. And I think now we need to balance to the right of the screen, where we say we have to start with an idea that will drive change down through the organization. And I believe those pivot ideas ought to come from the middle, not just the president and the board. But it ought to be the heart of the institution. I'm not putting down anybody who's a president or a board member. It ought to be on those who face both to the student and to the institution who say, let's try this. And if it can work, then let's put it into the system. That's how change will take place in the middle. Does that make sense to you all? And, and if you pilot and start small, that can happen. Last thing, I'm so glad you laughed a little bit. It was, we were super serious this morning, and I was so, so appreciative for Brandon to be here and sort of make us laugh a bit as well. And our team was talking about there is joy in this work. Right? This is the right time to be in higher ed. This is not the wrong time to be in higher ed. The, if you want to be a part of monumental change, you are in the right place at the right time. And if you want to see the next generation of students be impacted, this is the call, right? This is the call. And there's great joy in this work. I'm, I, one of the things I miss about not being on a campus is getting to watch graduation and recognizing the people who go across the stage. Uh, you know, I used to say, oh my gosh, I don't know how he made it or how she made it. <laughs> Do you still have that, right? Or I know the story behind that student. You know that? You all just shook your head because you know that story. There is a richness with this transformational partnership that you have. There is joy in this work. And we need to balance that with the challenge that we have as well. So I hope on Thursday, email is going like crazy when you get back and that there's an energy going on your campus. I want to thank you so much for putting some work time in. And then Mary, we take a little bit of a break right now. We take our, is it 15 minutes that we have? So let's take a nice stretch break, meet somebody you don't know. 10, she said it's only 10, 10 minutes, okay.